by Bushfires on Gardening Australia. Then Vera, later Doc Martin. Tonight, South Australia partially reopens its border to Victoria. After, like, my fourth lockdown, it's very relieving to be able to finally come back. We just need to get a test and then, uh, then we're free to go about. Also tonight, Sydney's COVID cluster grows, forcing more than a million people into lockdown. Concern about the welfare of several Australians after a high-rise apartment collapse in Florida. And the sands of time depicting Indigenous Dreamtime stories. Good evening, Emma Rebellato with ABC News. Some Victorians are being welcomed back into South Australia once again after the hard border closure with the neighbouring state was lifted at midnight. But late this afternoon, SA Police announced that anyone who's been to Tier 1 or Tier 2 exposure sites in Melbourne is now banned from entering South Australia. Anyone else visiting from Melbourne will still have to get a test when they arrive as that city attempts to get on top of two cases which have spread from Sydney's growing outbreak. Sarah Mullins reports. Touching down after a four week lockout. After like my fourth lockdown, it's very relieving to be able to finally come back. SA opened its border overnight just in time for school holidays, despite two new positive cases in Melbourne yesterday. We just need to get a test and then, uh, then we're free to go about. My son's going to the football tomorrow night, so that's pretty good for him. Um, and we might just catch the tram down to Glenelg and we might go to the zoo. Sydney's outbreak has jumped the border and spread to Victoria. And as the situation continues to evolve in Melbourne, anyone who's visited key exposure sites will no longer be allowed to enter SA. While all travellers from Greater Melbourne will have to get a test as soon as they arrive. But the state government is adamant that opening up the border is still the right call. Even though earlier this year authorities refused to let Victorians in until there were 14 days in a row of no new cases. I'm satisfied that the methodology that we put in place uh, to identify when we do close borders or we do put restrictions in place is the right methodology. The border to New South Wales, however, remains slammed shut. South Australians returning from Sydney today will have to go straight into 14 days of home isolation. Ah, it's life. It's life. I travel for work. It's life. For Katrina and Rodney Dart, it was an emotional journey to get to Adelaide. We have a terminally ill niece who's got a couple of days to live, so we're down to um... say our farewell. The Darts live on a farm in regional New South Wales near Port Macquarie, so SA Health was able to grant them an exemption to visit their niece in palliative care. We had to move heaven and earth to get here, I tell you. Border closures once again causing heartache for Australians across the country. Sarah Mullins, ABC News, Adelaide. In just under five hours, more than a million Sydney siders will be ordered to stay home. The new rules apply to everyone who lives or works in four areas of inner Sydney. The New South Wales government says it had no choice because the Delta variant is still spreading. It comes after the discovery of another 22 infections. Ashley Raper reports. Just moments after the restrictions were announced, shoppers flocked to supermarkets and shelves were cleared of toilet paper. But generally, people were supportive of the new measures. Stay at home, do a bit of cooking. Got some recipe books we want to get through. It's very disheartening and it's very depressing. Obviously we don't like it, but you know we've got to do it, unfortunately. The Premier says she's relying on everyone to do the right thing. I think people get the drift because we've been down this path before. Stay-at-home orders will be enforced in four council areas, including the City of Sydney, for at least a week. The rules apply to people who live or work in these areas. They can only leave their home for four essential reasons. It's a very proportionate response. Uh, we've chosen not to uh, do the stay-at-home orders uh, in a broader area. But there are concerns the advice is confusing and the lockdown may not go far enough. What the AMO believes would be the right move is a 
lockdown of the Sydney Basin, the whole of Sydney doing the same thing, rules applying equally to everybody. New South Wales has recorded 22 new locally acquired cases, with 65 now linked to the Bondi cluster. And there's one workplace in particular, a hair salon in Sydney's east, where there's fear of a major spread after at least three staff members and two clients tested positive. What we're concerned is the over 900 clients that attended, that potentially are at contacts, may acquire the infection. Public health orders for drivers involved in transporting international flight crew will also be tightened. Police are still investigating an unvaccinated limousine driver believed to have been linked to the initial outbreak. The guidelines that have existed will be uh, now pushed into very clear uh, orders with very clear consequences. As the city shuts up shop, anxious workers and businesses are hoping this modified lockdown will work. A good decision. I mean, obviously it's a tense time for everyone and we're hoping that this doesn't expand into something bigger, but I think it's the right decision at this point. We'll know if that's true in a week. Ashley Raper, ABC News, Sydney. As the contact tracers scramble to get the outbreak under control, there's concern the partial lockdown doesn't go far enough. As the ABC's Norman Swan explains, the cases being detected outside of the inner city suburbs suggest stricter measures might be needed. Today's New South Wales Health press conference was confusing, which makes it hard to decide whether the lockdown in four local government areas is sufficient. And despite the appearance of transparency, it's clear that for various reasons, we're not given all the current information. So it's a bit of a detective job to piece the story together. This is what we think is the timeline. Sometime prior to the 16th of June, a man in his 60s caught the coronavirus perhaps as early as the 11th of June. He's the limo driver, and we've never found out who gave it to him. It was probably flight crew, but it could have been somebody else. This could be a significant missing link in the chain of transmission. Who did this mysterious person see and come in contact with only a few days ago? The man passed it to his partner at home, a woman in a Vaucluse cafe, and probably several others at the Westfield Mall at Bondi Junction between the 11th and the 13th of June. Here's where it starts to get away. Some of those people passed it to members of their households, and one of them, a 20-year-old woman, took the virus with her to a birthday party last weekend in southwest Sydney. This birthday party was extraordinary. As of today, at least 17 people out of the 30 at the party became infected, including a man who went back to Victoria. We haven't heard a lot about him and the extent to which the contact tracers have got to the bottom of his story, although he appears to have spread it to a colleague in a dry cleaners. He seems to have been missed initially by the New South Wales contact tracers. And there have been small clusters elsewhere, such as a hairdressing salon in Double Bay, a healthcare setting, and a Paddington pizzeria. And while there are many hundreds of people in isolation, and most cases have been linked, there are still cases under investigation, and a nine-year-old child who's been a mystery for several days. So if you look at a map of Greater Sydney and beyond, here are where cases and significant locations have turned up. Far more than the four local government areas locked down. Norman Swan there. After months of pressure from premiers and the opposition, the federal government is offering to build purpose-built quarantine centres in Perth and Brisbane. The policy shift means more Australians will eventually be able to return from home from overseas. The Commonwealth has also decided on a location for a Melbourne quarantine facility. Here's political reporter Jade McMillan. From the beginning of the pandemic, the Prime Minister's been a staunch defender of the hotel quarantine system. If I told you a year ago when we did this that, you know, I reckon we do this, we'll get a 99.9% .9 success rate, I think you would have told me that, mate, I know you believe in miracles, but that's, that's, that's a bit of a stretch. But nearly 18 months in, the Commonwealth is now proposing new purpose-built facilities similar to the Northern Territory's Howard Springs Centre. This really is about the medium to long term, recognising that uh, the potential for these sites to be able to be used for a range of purposes into the future. 
Scott Morrison has written to the West Australian Premier suggesting two possible sites near the Perth or Jandicott airports. We just want to crack on and get this done as soon as we can. Queensland's proposal for a site near Toowoomba has been rejected, with Mr Morrison instead flagging the Damascus Army barracks in Brisbane. I think what uh, Queenslanders uh, liked about the regional quarantine proposal was the distance between this facility and people's homes. This uh, Pink and Bar proposal uh, is in the suburbs of Brisbane and so we'll need to consider that uh, very, very carefully. The Commonwealth has also settled on Mickleham in Melbourne's north as the site for Victoria's planned facility. This would have been ideal 12 months ago. The federal government is open to deals with other states and territories as long as they commit to running the centres. The sites would also need to be close to an international airport as well as a major hospital. And the quarantine places must come on top of existing capacity in hotels. It's hoped the Melbourne facility will be up and running by the end of this year, but the Perth and Brisbane centres will take much longer, prompting questions as to why the Prime Minister didn't act sooner. We have been saying day after day, week after week, month after month, since this time last year and indeed before then, that appropriate national quarantine facilities needed to be put in place. Each centre will cost hundreds of millions of dollars, an acknowledgement quarantine is likely to be a long-term necessity. Jade McMillan, ABC News, Canberra. The Northern Territory's anti-corruption watchdog has made damning findings about a group of people who worked to secure a $12 million grant for a Darwin Turf Club grandstand. The Territory's ICAC has also found a board member of Thoroughbred Racing SA engaged in improper conduct and may be prosecuted. Brett Dixon, who is also the chair of the Darwin Turf Club, was endorsed by South Australia's Sports Minister and appointed to the TRSA board in 2019. The Territory's Chief Minister says he won't be found at this year's Darwin Cup, enjoying a taxpayer-funded $12 million grandstand. After the tender process for that government grant has been found to be riddled with improper conduct. I believe we failed the community expectations about how we handled this. I believe we are now putting in place all the measures necessary so the community is not failed again. This $12 million should never have been spent in the first place. The Territory's anti-corruption watchdog has found a group of people involved in the tender awarded two years ago, including the Chief Minister's former Chief of Staff, Elf Leonardi, and the Darwin Turf Club chairman, Brett Dixon, acted improperly. And that overall the process applied was deeply flawed and was affected by political donations, lobbying, failure to declare hospitality, a potpourri of conflicts of interest, abusive process, false statements, fanciful claims of economic benefit and a cavalier proponent. The grandstand tender was awarded to a company Mr Dixon co-chaired, JTEX, and the ICAC found he didn't disclose this conflict to the board and kept attending meetings. The level of dishonesty exposed by the ICAC is appalling, as they have found the government was thwarted at every turn from getting that money back, fuelled by self-interest and deceit. Mr Dixon, whose companies made sizeable political donations to Labor, was helped by Mr Leonardi, who drafted a letter for him to persuade the government. If no one in the Gunner government knew or was involved in the $12 million deal, then why, when that decision landed on their lap in Cabinet, did they approve it? The government's now calling for the entire Turf Club board to resign, even if some members weren't involved at the time, to restore public confidence. And the ICAC says it may refer Mr Dixon's conduct to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Felicity James, ABC News. One of the armed robbers, known as the Overall Bandits, has had multiple years added to his jail sentence for drug offences. The court heard the repeat offender went back to a life of crime after being released on parole. Armed with shotguns and sledgehammers, the so-called Overall Bandits terrorised banks in Adelaide's East in 2005 and 2006 in distinctive disguises inspired by the big screen. Nice. 
Andrew Dominic Davey and James Randall Smith were sentenced to 16 years jail for the armed robberies. After being released on parole, the district court heard Davey went on the run and returned to using drugs. When police tracked him down, they discovered nearly 400 grams of methamphetamine and nearly $100,000 in cash. The now 36-year-old pleaded guilty to trafficking in a commercial quantity of a controlled drug and money laundering. Davy told the court he was being threatened by an unnamed bikey gang and was acting as their drug courier. The judge said he was prepared to accept that evidence because he didn't believe Davy had the acumen to run a drug business on that scale. But he said that didn't excuse or mitigate the serious nature of the offending. He was living a pathetic existence. He certainly wasn't living the life of Riley. The fact of the matter is that he was involved in serious drug transactions simply in order to pay debts that he had run up by other drug transactions. Judge Cuthbertson added four years to Davy's sentence, which now totals more than eight years. He set a new non-parole period of five years. Candice Prosser, ABC News, Adelaide. A desperate search and rescue mission is continuing in the United States tonight, with nearly 100 people still missing after the collapse of a 12-storey apartment building in Miami. This was the moment part of the building came down early Thursday morning local time. It was captured on a nearby security camera. The huge tower collapsing into a pile of rubble and concrete. An Australian couple is feared among the missing, with officials holding grave concerns for the dozens unaccounted for. North America correspondent Greg Jennett reports from Miami. High on the mounds of steel and concrete, their touch was delicate. To extract a young boy entombed in the shards of 12 fallen stories. Don't leave me, was his panicked request. His mother was in there somewhere too. Once heavy plumes of dust had settled, the teams roamed gingerly into the rubble. Above, stranded residents were plucked from their sheared off half homes to give their accounts of their scramble downstairs in the early hours. And then when we got down to the garage and saw the water, we, we couldn't even understand what, what was happening here. They'd swapped the precipice of Champlain Towers south for its fast-filling, watery cavern below. Almost 100 emergency crews surged in before daybreak, and when it did, the breakage was even more breathtaking. Beds teetered. The private little worlds in 55 apartments laid bare. Their residents' worldly possessions were now open to all. Attempts were made to put up some shutters because the tally of the missing rose sharply. We are all praying. We are all crying. We are all here with the suffering families. Beachside in salty years and 40 years old, Champlain Towers collapse can't be explained by its location or environment alone. Plenty of other buildings along Miami Beach have withstood the same tests of age and hurricanes. That's why investigators are looking at all possibilities. Roof repairs, recent construction next door and the stability of soils below. Forlorn friends are left to run their own search for clues on the missing. There's not much information besides most of the family members are behind me now in one of the rooms over there giving uh, DNA. So I don't know if that's positive news, but I don't think so. Joseph Wax is concerned for a Sydney couple who come and go to their tower apartment and family in Florida. They both became grandparents yet again a few hours before the tragedy. We still cannot believe it. Belief and hope can't last forever. Neither will the searching. And Greg Jennett is in Miami where that rescue operation is in full swing. And a short time ago I asked him if we know how long authorities will continue the search. 
That's a call they're really reluctant to make, Emma, for reasons that I'm sure everyone can appreciate. That is, while there still could be life, there is hope. But you're right, there is now an intensity, a mechanical intensity here with the excavators just behind me now trying to carefully as they can pull pieces of rubble away. And so it's no longer just humans crawling over this pile of debris. Uh, many expectations are that that search phase of the operation will continue for at least another 24 to 48 hours before the difficult decision has to be made about switching it to recovery mode, recovery, quite obviously, of human bodies. Then, once that decision is made, there is is the bigger question to answer, the question the world is asking, Emma, and that is what on earth might have caused the Champlain Towers South to collapse as it did. And that's the engineering inquiry. It really can't begin in earnest until everything else has run its course on the search and recovery. And when it does, there are many leads for inquiry. Geological stability around here, recent construction work. And the answers from that investigation will take surely many, many weeks, if not months. Emma? Greg Janet there. About 40 tonnes of sand has been carted into the city's east end to create giant drawings for the launch of Adelaide's newest festival. The drawings depict two Aboriginal Dreamtime stories and have been created in the lead up to the Illuminate Festival. Organisers say these are the largest Indigenous indoor sand drawings anywhere in the country. It makes me feel very proud, first of all. They represent dreaming stories close to the hearts of Ghana artists Derek Lynch and Farron Ferber. One tells the story of Wati Ningita, who chased 13 sisters from the Flinders Ranges in South Australia to Apatula in the southeast of the NT. It's a story that hasn't been told for a very long time. Um, last time it was performed was back in 2001. The other tells of a large group of birds that came to waterholes from the east. It means a lot to me because I get to um, honour my grandfather and um, it's also a connection that I have through my grandfather doing this. After months of planning, it took four days to create them by hand. They'll be on display until next month when a cultural performance will be held on the sand to kick off the Illuminate Light Technology and Art Festival. Before then, the East End is playing host to another event, FOMO Fridays. It's estimated only about 70% of the people who worked in or visited the city before COVID-19 have come back. The government's spending $800,000 to bring back more. People have been working from home on Friday. I've got to say, stop it. Come back to work. Spend some money in the CBD. Get out on a Friday night. Come, in, come back to work on Friday. Celebrate with your mates after work. The event begins with a street party tonight. Imogen Hain, ABC News, Adelaide. To finance now and a new survey says investors will wear lower returns for greater benefits to society. Here's Daniel Ziffer. Do people want companies to do the right thing, even if it costs them money? New research suggests yes. For a survey, investment bank UBS offered 1,000 Australians a choice. Would you give up 5% or more of your retirement savings to invest in options that were ESG aware? A new buzz phrase about doing the right thing by the environment, society and having good governance. More than half of respondents said yes. In the field of energy, more generous thinking. Asked to rank their top two priorities, consumers want more affordability for all, preventing climate change and investing in new technology ahead of factors that directly impact them, like reliability. US indices keep rewriting their record closes, leading to rises on our markets. Respected former Bendigo and Adelaide boss Mike Hurst has joined the board of financial hot mess AMP. Based on what it's done to the share price today, instead of a director's fee, he should be working on percentage. Borrell jumped as part of a takeover play. And our magic cash-generating rocks, iron ore, are still above 210 US dollars a tonne, with currencies flat or up a touch. And that's finance. 
Brisbane has leapfrogged Geelong on the AFL ladder after a thumping win in round 15 at the Gabba. The Lions' key forwards, Joe Danaher and Charlie Cameron, kicked seven goals between them to lead Brisbane to a 44-point win. While for Geelong, it was one of the, its worst attacking games, with just seven goals scored in total. It's, it's just not going to work for you every week. And, um, yeah, a couple of these games coming home just will um, strengthen us. The Lions now sit in third position on the table, just ahead of the Cats in fourth. At Westlake's Adelaide Crows coach Matthew Nix is confident both Paul Seedsman and Brody Smith will be fit to play against Carlton on Sunday. Smith didn't train at all on Thursday because of back spasms and Seedsman left the field early after twisting his neck in a tackling drill. But Nix says Smith has recovered well and despite the scare at training, Seedsman should also be named to take on the Blues. We had a great session out in the wet uh, Thursday which you know, might be an indication of where the game goes on the weekend with the roof open. So we were pleased to get that one in. Unfortunately with that you get a bit of bash and crash and Cedo took a, a pretty good hit. So he's pulled up quite well, we're confident, we're 95% sure he'll, he'll be um, as good as gold. Luke Brown and Lockie Scholl return for the Crows who will fly in and out of Melbourne on Sunday for the clash at Docklands. Port Adelaide has celebrated Refugee Week, hosting hundreds of students for its annual Power Intercultural Carnival today. One young South Australian umpire shared his inspirational story and his dreams of one day taking charge of a game on the big stage in the AFL. This is Abdul Malik, a South Australian umpire who only learnt the game last year. And while most kids his age dream of being a star player, his ambition is to be the man with the whistle. Umpiring is just a bit different, you know, it's, uh, you get to observe the game, you see some really amazing stuff uh, on the field and yeah, it's, it's just a different atmosphere. The 17-year-old moved to Australia from Libya in 2011, falling in love with the AFL after playing the sport at school. The way it's played, uh, like the team spirit of the game, uh, playing it with my friends at school, that was very fun. But the teenager didn't understand the rules until he was introduced to Port Adelaide's intercultural program last year. One year on, he's already umpiring juniors at SANFL level and hopes to one day make it to the AFL. But first, he has to figure out how to get his friends to play to the whistle. When I have the whistle, my friends just beg for a freeze, but they're not getting it. <laughs> Abdul Malik joined hundreds of students at the Power's annual carnival today, celebrating education, culture and football. Port Adelaide's Alir Alir understands the kids more than most, forging his own career after being born in a refugee camp in Kenya. Hopefully I can inspire them to, to want to do something, They're not necessarily play sport, but uh, whether it's just focusing on studying or just doing something with their life, um, I think that's the bigger message. His message is clear ahead of the Power's clash against the Swans. The first time he's faced his old side since making the move to Port. Obviously, I've got some good mates there, um, but at the end of the day, you know, I'll, I'll play for Port Adelaide, so I'll have a chat with them after the game. But you know, I've got a job to do, and um, that's to play well and uh, get the win for Port Adelaide. Another top eight test for the power. Cameron Slesser, ABC News, Adelaide. On to the weather now, and thanks to Ken Wolf for tonight's photo taken at Basham Beach in Middleton. It was another cold and wet day in Adelaide today. It reached 14.1 degrees about midday after last night's low of 10.5. There were showers right across southern parts of the state today as well as isolated storms about the southeast. The tops range from 7 degrees at Mount Lofty to 17 at Oodnadatta. Cloud over the northeast with a trough is generating showers over Queensland, while a low is producing showers and storms over our state and the southeast. Tomorrow, an approaching front will bring more showers to our state and Tasmania, but a high should keep most of the interior dry and clear. Interstate showers in Hobart and Canberra with 12 degrees, similar in Brisbane with 17, 19 degrees for Perth. Back home, morning fog over the west with frost about the Flinders district and possible showers over the mid-north, 16 degrees in Sejuna, 14 for Lee Creek. Further south, showers are likely near the southern coast's ranges and lower southeast, 13 degrees in Maitland, 15 for Renmark. A strong wind warning has been issued for the south central and lower southeast coasts for tomorrow. A road weather alert is also in place for the Adelaide Hills tonight, as well as a warning to sheep graziers for the mid-north. 
Partly cloudy in the city tomorrow with a chance of showers reaching a top of 15 degrees after tonight's low of 8. On the waters, south to southwesterly winds reaching 20 knots, then turning west to northwesterly later, with seas up to 1.5 metres. Sunrise just after 20 past 7, with sunset about a quarter past 5. Looking ahead, a shower or two on Sunday with 16 degrees, mostly fine with tops of 17 for Monday and Tuesday, before showers develop on Wednesday and continue through to this time next week. And that's the latest from the Adelaide Newsroom. Thanks for your company. Good night.